uh, without further ado, we had a little uh, a little technical flub, but um, Jonathan is is with us from uh, I don't know if, I, if you can you can only see a fraction of the students right now, but that's okay. Uh, uh, one of uh, I sent you guys his bio, but um, a uh, great lawyer. Uh, he's based in Florida, but he is a licensed pilot. He is an actual real lawyer. We're just talking about someone who maybe is not a real <laughs> lawyer, but but he's an actual real lawyer. Um, uh, and uh, he, as we, as I mentioned really briefly earlier, he's an expert in the legal issues with this burgeoning field that you guys are all learning about, um, uh, unmanned aerial vehicles. And so he, not only is he uh, uh, knowledgeable of the law, he's actually um, served on various panels, he's written various books. Um, I, I discovered it only a couple weeks ago, so it's a bit late for our class, but uh, it's one that there's a couple ones that are probably useful to us. Uh, he has several publications, um, and I'll, I'll be sharing all those with you guys after today. Um, but uh, some of which are, it gets way into the legal weeds. It's not really maybe appropriate for most of us, but a lot of it, um, especially the summary stuff, is perfect. And, you, and as we know, uh, the legal aspect is one key thing that you guys can be learning about over the course of the semester. And to use this new technology, we obviously want to follow the law and all this and that, but the law is this, in this particular area, is not like criminal law. It's, it's sort of evolving all the time. So almost every few months, there's some new burble up. And so this is something that you guys can't just learn about in here. You guys need to learn about it. And then every few months, sort of check back in, check back in, because it is an evolving landscape. And so. So with that introduction, I'll shut up and let uh, Jonathan start to talk. And so, um, Jonathan, I think you can hear folks, but maybe we'll let you go for a while. And then at the end, we'll if we have some questions, we can bump in. That way, I'll, I'll just let you go. Sound good? Sure, sounds great. Great. And we got, you on the, we got your uh, uh, drone law slide on the screen, so I think we can see everything you're showing up. Thank you. Awesome. Yeah, thanks so much for uh, letting me talk. I really appreciate this opportunity. So I will talk to you today about drone law and all sorts of other things that aren't law, but that kind of get, you know, brought into it, you know. <laughs> so, um, yeah, you briefly talked about my uh, my background. Uh, I have a, actually drone civilian uses book. You guys have probably already seen the American Bar Association publishing another book. I published the drone log book recently, and I have another book I'm working on as a co-author on flight instructing for drones specifically, and then two more books after that are in the works. So that's kind of what I'm doing, a lot of book writing. So here's the outline we'll be talking about is history of drones, guidance documents, and then presently what's going on, and then future what will be going on. Well, history of unmanned aircraft, there's different uh, strains of, of why unmanned aircraft were created. They were used as weapons, targets, military decoys, data gathering, and recreation. Those were kind of like the five strains that enter weaved over the years uh, with each other and then eventually came to be known as what we have kind of today of the unmanned aircraft. So, I mean, early on, they were used as weapons. Uh, the, the idea was like, there were aerial torpedoes, kind of like really crude cruise missiles. Uh, Nikola Tesla came up with the idea. However, it wasn't actually implemented until later on because uh, gyroscopes were later invented. So they had a crude autopilot stabilization. Uh, so basically you just launch it and then it would dive on the target at some point. Uh, Germans during World War I also developed a similar idea to launch the drones from the Zeppelins and then you could control them via copper wire um, to, to their target. Uh, then as time went on, uh, primarily between the uh, World War I, World War II, they were used more for targets than they were for weapons. Uh, that was kind of like the age of the battleship still. We're going to build bigger and better battleships. We don't, you know, stinking little uh, aircraft. Uh, so what happened was um, uh, they there was a, uh, a, a German battleship that was sunk uh, by uh, General Billy Mitchell. They did a training exercise, kind of a demonstration to see if uh, an aircraft could actually take out a battleship. And so that kind of got people's attention, but they still thought the battleship was the way to go. They threw uh, more and more machine guns onto the battleships to knock the drone, you know, the, the aircraft out of the sky. And so in order to get really good at uh, hitting these targets, you need to actually have target drones. So they ended up uh, flying those things around quite, uh, quite a bit for the Navy, but they still had a really hard time um, actually hitting the aircraft. And uh, it was actually interesting. Um, uh, 
uh, one of the battleships uh, that was later on sunk in Pearl Harbor three years prior, they did a whole live fire exercise with target drones. And uh, I think they only hit like two of them, you know, and it's kind of like this is a, a premonition of what was coming down the pipe three years later when when that battleship was actually sunk in Pearl Harbor by the Japanese. Uh, and then what happened is uh, w uh, when the war broke out, uh, target drones were getting bought up like crazy. Um, one of the popular ones around that time frame uh, was, I believe it was like over 14,000 of them were actually made uh, for, the, for the United States military overall. And uh, what was interesting was uh, the guy that invented that actually called up his buddy, Ronald Reagan, uh, who was a uh, captain in the United States Army's uh, Motion Picture Corps out in Hollywood. And he went out to film the, the building of these, these target drones. And that's where the private that was taking the pictures actually spotted uh, Marilyn Monroe, um, actually. So that was kind of an interesting uh, point. And then uh, later on in the 60s, 70s, they were used as military decoys. Israelis used them as decoys in the uh, uh, was it Yom Kippur War, which was kind of interesting. Basically, you just launch them out front of your uh whatever you whatever location you're wanting to attack all the surface to air missiles would go off hitting all the targets they can't reload the sams uh quick enough so then all the military fighter jets you know the, the, the strike aircraft come in real quickly and mop up and that was that's how the israelis used it um that's also how the americans used it with the quail for the b-52s uh during uh, vietnam it had the same radar signature as a b-52 so as they, you could actually be carried in the bomb bay doors. They would open it up and launch it straight out in front of the uh, uh, the bomber group to kind of get all the, the SAMs, if you will, clear those out. And then they were used in data gathering. So uh, way back in as early as the Civil War, you had, I mean, actually even before that, Napoleon had a whole balloon regiment. And they were used for reconnaissance um, for uh, the battlefields. What was interesting is back in the early 1900s, they actually developed two treaties. There were two treaty signs specifically on balloon warfare that they did not want to actually have balloons uh, dropping bombs because they kind of felt that was a little too, uh, um, that, that was against kind of a, the general, you know, way they, they were doing war. So that there was treaties actually signed to stop that. But, you know, that was kind of a little bit later on ignored uh, during World War One. And then lastly, recreation, you know, the Academy of Model Aeronautics was developed, I believe it was 1936, if I'm correct. Uh, so it's been around for quite a while. So let's get into how the FAA actually regulates manned aircraft. And then you have unmanned aircraft. Now, a lot of this stuff applies to manned aircraft, but unmanned aircraft has, the FAA kind of just does it a little bit differently. Like they don't really, tr everything doesn't work the same. It's just kind of the same, but not. So advisory circulars, policy statements, and federal aviation regulations. Those are the three ways the FAA primarily regulates uh, aircraft in the national airspace. Now, advisory circulars are just that. They're advisory. They're not binding. It's not law. And the only way they can actually become law is if that advisory uh, circular is actually specifically incorporated by reference into a regulation. Okay, but remember, why is it considered a law at that point in binding? Because it actually is a regulation. It's just kind of outsourcing uh, all that language, saying, "Hey, this advisory circular." There's, there's, it's very, very, very rare that's that's ever happened, and it's primarily like in the mechanic stuff, uh, standards for um, uh, uh, manufacturing and stuff like that. But generally, what the FAA uses for advisory circulars is non-binding. And the one that was primarily on point was 9157, okay, which later on was canceled. And um, uh, it's actually interesting is how, okay, this one was, was issued originally in 1981. It was voluntary guidance. Uh, primarily, you, should, you shouldn't fly over 400 feet, not within three miles of an airport, not near noise-sensitive areas. FAA accidentally canceled it in August of 2014, reinstated it. And then as of uh, actually, they actually early this year, they actually updated it and put out the new advisory circular 9157A. And even, and even then they had a typo in it. So they actually updated it even again. So you kind of, there's a whole bunch of sloppiness going on there. Uh, now, once again, advisory, not actual law. Um, what's also interesting is the advisory circulars. Now, that's when the FAA actually proposes them and you know, publishes them out, but there have actually been four advisory circulars 
that were proposed by an aviation rule advisory committee uh, to the FAA, but the FAA actually had never adopted them. So when people, when, okay, when the FAA is like, hey, we're kind of uh, new to this whole drone thing, we don't know exactly how to handle it. It's like, wait a second here, guys. Back in 1996, uh, this advisory, um, that you were presented with four advisory circulars on unmanned aircraft maintenance, pilot training and qualification, aircraft design and operations. However, yet you did not actually choose to adopt as uh, advisory circulars and publish them. And we've been operating under that one document, uh, 9157A, uh, 9157 uh, 1990, uh, from the 1981. And so it's like, what's up? But it, it kind of plays into their whole, uh, they are fumbling with what they're doing and they're kind of pretending to be like, they are the victim as opposed to maybe being just, you know, you know poor man managers. <laughs> That's a nice way to say it. That, that's I a mean, generous way to say that. it. I mean, like, you had four advisory circulars back in 1996. Nobody ever mentions that. And what's also really interesting is uh, the individual who's head of uh, um, uh, safety standards, okay, who is the boss of the boss of the boss of the unmanned integration office, that lady's name is actually on those documents. So it's like, hmm, yeah, you know what was going on. You, your name is on that document. So don't give me that, you know, so they, they've known what's going on for a long time. They just chose not to do anything. Big difference. So policy statements and interpretive rules, um, whatever those are. And what I mean by whatever those are, it's, that is one, that's a really nasty little area of administrative law because um, there's, there's law and then there's that the agency saying what their interpretation of is of the rules and which isn't law, but it's kind of like, uh, you know, a hit list, if you will, you cross that line, then that agency is going to come after you. However, a court might actually say, hey, agency, you're wrong. <laughs> like, I don't know how you came to this conclusion. This was completely arbitrary and capricious uh, of you doing this. And we actually going to find um, the, the defendant uh, was, was, you know, it should not be fined. Uh, so it, it, that's a whole and interesting area right now. That's one of the points that we're making in the whole Taylor v. FAA lawsuit that's going on right now in the D.C. Circuit Court of Appeals that I'm involved with is that the FAA is, uh, it, it's like, it's not really law, but, you know, do you really want to deal with a big bully? You know, so it does, in effect, almost become law because everybody complies with it. So uh, what, now what happens is, these policy statements, originally, it's kind of like you want to do guidance, you know, help everyone comply with the, uh, the regulations, with what Congress told the agency to actually do. But then people realize it's so much easier to actually just hit uh, publish with a PDF or HTML, you know, uploading on a website and do that as opposed to going about the whole long regulatory process. So, it, it they are simplistically wise, just you know, pragmatically also just just doing this. That's what a lot of agencies have um, resorted to. They can change their position at any time, and it's explanatory rather than mandatory. Now, now all these little points here that I'm making are actually from a uh, D.C. Circuit Court of Appeals case uh, dealing with the uh, in EPA. Actually, the FAA is not the only agency that's been doing this. So, how the court actually explained it was that. Congress passes this broadly worded statute, and rightly so. They don't really know what the future is going to hold. So they're like, hey, agency, we want you to do this. And then there's like a word in there. And it's open ended phrases, standards. No one really knows what that means. And as time goes on, the agency issues these circulars, these guidance memoranda, whatever those mean. It's like different words for like these documents, and no one really kind of knows exactly like what's what on those, or what's the force of. Like, what's the difference between a circular and a guidance and a memoranda? It's like, I don't know, other than if they're spelled different. <laughs> I mean, in effect, they're the same, actually. But you're like, I don't, I don't really know. Yet they give different weights to them sometimes. And you end up having document, and then you have to have another document to interpret the document, and then you have to have a third document to interpret the two documents. Oh, and new stuff came out, so we have to have a fourth document, which conflicts with the third document. Now we got a fifth document. And everyone's like, oh, like, yeah, yeah we get the point. It's like, yeah, that's actually the really big annoying part that the courts are making is that it just goes on and on. And you guys are just completely trying to evade judicial review by publishing PDFs 
and by uh, hiding them out almost on their website. Like, how many of you guys in this class, just for the show of hands, how many of you guys go to the FAA's website and actually like look around for documents? So you can't see everybody <laughs> right now, but the three people out of about uh, 18 are raising their hands. Oh wow, it's like overachievers. That's how <laughs> the um. Uh, how many of you guys went to like the EPA's website and looked around for guidance documents? Uh, one. Oh man, hey, put your hand down. You don't do that. Like no. <laughs> man, what are you? What are you? What are you a lawyer or something? You fun? <laughs> um. Uh, yeah, so very rarely do people go to these websites and actually try to find this because they go to normally the laws and then they, that's what they stop. They don't really run around on the FA's web, website, you know, one of the many little tabs that you have to click on. And what was even really more annoying is that in the FA's database, they weren't even properly citing that certain uh, documents were actually overruled. So you had to just kind of like search around to see if there was like a newer uh, updated version. So nobody was really on notice. Uh, they were also getting into just uploading comments on their website uh, with, with HTML. I actually put a track changes um, uh, program to monitor all the websites that, that they had some interesting stuff on. And prior to the ruling of the administrative law judge in the Perker case, which was the, the FA went after a guy for flying his drone, the FA had some really strong language on their website where where individuals that are flying their drones must comply, blah, blah, blah. And it's like real strong language. ALJ, the administrative law judge, rules in favor of the drone flyer against the FAA. Like two days later, the HTML gets updated. And it's like drone operators are advised to, uh, and, and they just change it back and forth, back and forth. And they're still doing that. Uh, as though not as much, though, as they were in the past. So how do we actually get to where we are currently with unmanned aircraft? Uh, well, you have 9157, uh, 9157 from 1981. You also had those, uh, uh, the four proposed but not adopted advisory circulars from 1996. So those kind of went forward and individuals in the air traffic organization office, those are the guys that are looking at the uh, airspace and stuff, the air traffic controllers. They needed some guidance documents. So in 2005, the, this is an internal um, guidance document to the FAA guys, not to the public, on unmanned aircraft operations in national airspace. Okay, and so that, um, that was going on and it was explaining how civil aircraft could not get COAs and that they had to go the special air within a certificate route in the experimental category. Okay, so that, that's an interesting point right there. And I'll, I'll, I'll tie back in here in a little bit. And so, and then they said later on that uh, unmanned aircraft that comply with guidance in advisory circular 9157 are considered model aircraft for not evaluated by the unmanned aircraft criteria in this policy. So it's super, super easy to operate under an advisory circular 9157A, or 9157, uh, rather than get a special air readiness certificate or a COA for a public aircraft. So everyone did that. Okay, that was from 2005 going on. And so that, that's how everyone was doing commercial operations under 9157. Well, 2007, a policy statement uh, was issued. Uh, the FAA just issued in the Federal Register and it said advisory circular 9157 only applies to modelers and that specifically excludes its use by persons or companies for business purposes. Okay, so companies or businesses, you have um, non uh, nonprofits, agencies, any of that stuff cannot fall under 9157A. So that, that the FA's point at that time was that there need to be like a standard, okay? You had 9157A, special air within a certificate or COA, you had to fall in one of those boxes. And that was like your authority, if you will, is what they called it, the authority to actually operate in the national airspace. But did, did anyone catch the point that I made about 9157A being voluntary and it's an advisory circular? And now the FAA is saying nobody can operate, you know, without specific authority. Like you issued a piece of paper. How, how is that actual authority? Like, Con what? what you know yeah, so, so they, they just paper, html you. not even not even printed <laughs> right, it was just like okay you just published a paper and then said it's authority like i mean really like how easy is that so you just call it authority and then move on and bark really loudly and scare everybody so then at that point from 2007 onward then it you fell into one of three categories so if you were a civil aircraft 
You had to get a special air readiness certificate in the experimental category. If you were a public aircraft, you had to get a, a certificate of authorization or a waiver, a COA. And, and if you were a modeler, you had to go under 9157A, and that's how you had to operate. So here's the problem. People and commercial entities, people that were wanting to make money off of this, they're not going the special air readiness certificate route because it, that's a very lengthy, time-consuming process. So um, they were kind of like, hey, wait a second here. If we can't charge for these flights, well, we can come up with some other really interesting ways to make money uh, under 9157A. And furthermore, uh, the FAA kind of somewhat encouraged this. So look at what Les Dore, he was a spokesperson for the FAA in November, 20, uh, November 25th, 2013. He said this, farmers may operate an unmanned aircraft over their own, pers their own property for personal use and should operate safely as to minimize risk to other aircraft or people or property on the ground. Guidelines for the operation of model aircraft, such as those published by the Academy of Model Aeronautics, may be used by farmers as reference for safe model UAS operations. So guidelines right here, you have 9157A, the AMA uh, uh, reference, you know, this, their safe model operations. So if you operate under those for your own personal use on your own property, then you're fine. Well, so what people were doing is they weren't going out maybe commercially holding out as such. They were doing operations maybe for free. Um, and they were then charging a whole lot of money for the editing of the video. So kind of just getting cash from somewhere else, but the flight was for free. Or you were maybe a farmer flying on your own fields and in trying to increase crop yields. You weren't, you weren't holding out to the public, but you were just increasing efficiency for yourself. Well, this is November 25th, 2013. A little bit later in 2014, the uh, early 2014, the FAA publishes the model aircraft interpretive rule and it fixed this loopholes of the whole flying, not for the public, but somehow getting money out, you know, off the flight for some other, it's an indirect benefit. So, the FAA specifically listed out a farmer cannot actually use a drone to determine whether his crops need to be watered that are grown as part of a commercial farming operation. A realtor cannot use a model aircraft to photograph a property that he is trying to sell and use those photos in a property real estate listing. So notice both of those aren't holding out to the public. People came up with new ways to get around it. And so basically that FAA's interpretation at this point was from 2014 onward, and it still is, recreational flying means it's an individual not a business or a nonprofit or agency or state or county or whatever. Uh, and it's flying purely for recreational, you know, fl for, fl for fun n with no incidental or direct benefits whatsoever. No incidental, no direct benefits whatsoever. So if you're like taking pictures and throwing them up on YouTube to come up with a cool demo reel so you can maybe market yourself later on, that would be considered commercial because your intended goal is to somehow drum up money maybe later on, or maybe you fly for free for somebody. So they kind of, Hey, that's cool. Hey. And then you get a relationship going, you get the business card and then you get some, uh, uh, you know, get a, some money or deal or whatever a job later on. That's considered an incidental benefit. That was, you know, for, for the flight, you weren't getting directly paid, but later on you're trying to get some benefit. So that must mean, so, so incidental benefit must be in addition to enjoyment because otherwise, I mean, isn't enjoyment or an incidental benefit? Uh, well, right, exactly. But any in incidental benefit would be, yeah, pretty much anything other than just having fun and enjoyment, which kind of a little interesting there. Now, what what now? What happens? Let's say you go and fly your drone, doing photography because that's like your fun hobby. Now, the purpose of the flight was for fun. But then later on, somebody said, hey, I really like that. Can you sell that to me? And you go, oh, okay, can I do that? Well, the FAA governs the operation of the aircraft, not photography or somehow photography in commerce, okay? It's not like the Federal Trade Commission here where your your photos are like tainted forever and you have to like throw them away like they're uh, co cocaine or something. It's like, oh, it's a country, <laughs> throw it away. It's like, no, your operation would have... Um, was fine because you were flying per, uh, for recreational purposes. Later on, somebody wanted to pay for it. So that's perfectly fine. However, you look exactly like a commercial operator who's trying to come up with this really interesting, like, oh, I was just flying recreationally. So you look exactly like a guy that FA might want to come after. So just be, uh, you know, you don't want to be playing how close I can I get to the fire without getting burned. <laughs>
I mean, if you do, we specialize uh, I have my contact info at the end of the slide. Please take it down and then call me when you do get in trouble. You know, I'll, I'll give you a special discount rate because of this class. You know, for, for limited time only, for 1999. So, uh, so what's going on right now? Different types of aircraft. You have public aircraft. They're fulfilling a governmental purpose. You have civil aircraft and... You know, I don't even know what you would really want to call model aircraft, recreational aircraft, or non-model aircraft, because that, that terminology hasn't been fully uh, cleaned up, if you will. Because model aircraft is like a small model, like, right? So you have like a B-17, a P-51, that's like a small version of the big version, right? And you fly it for fun. But what in the world's a quadcopter, right? Like a Phantom. That's not a model. We don't have like a big version of a, of a Phantom. Uh, and if we did, I want one. That would be kind of cool. <laughs> I, can, I, I would, I would just like, I wouldn't drive to work. I just fly everywhere. Um, the, the Chinese are trying to make one. I think I'm not sure. <laughs> I, I guess you could try, but then yeah, there's all sorts of fun that'll happen there. Uh, but so the whole term model and recreational hasn't been fully clarified. I mean, you could call it, like for purposes of one of the uh, the the uh, sections that Congress passed, they called it a model aircraft. Uh, so that's. I think the probably better way to describe it is they call it a model aircraft, even though phantoms are not, they're not model like of anything. So I just lump them all public aircraft, civil aircraft, the two versions of uh, the two small uh, subcategories of civil aircraft is model or non-model. And really we could actually break it down into model, but they're non-compliant with operation model. But now we're getting into like splitting so many little hairs that uh, Vidal Sassoon would be getting upset. So uh definitions of public uh aircraft so what is a public aircraft okay you have to fall into one of five categories um of ownership so it's uh it's exclusively owned by the united states government you have another one that's operated by it's owned by the government but operated by any persons for purposes related to crew training equipment development or demonstration so that's like your uh uh flying drones overseas uh you know like predators and stuff like that it's owned by the government. However, they can hire contractors to come in and fly those uh, those missions or training missions, even here locally. Uh, so that, that's what they can do. Um, owned or operated by any government, a state of the District of Columbia, territory, subdivision. So that's your police departments, your local, you know, California EPA or whatever. That they would all fall into that category. And then now with D, now it's exclusively leased for at least con uh, con 90 days continuously. There's only one little uh, exception around that, and that's for search and rescue. Uh, it has to be like very special um, uh, circumstances. There's four criteria you have to meet, and that's only for search and rescue purposes. You can just quickly go out, grab a civilian aircraft, and get public aircraft um, status. So, what? Well, quick, quick, quick. Uh, I can get back up here. Why do you want public aircraft operation status? I was like, well, why would I want? Why would I care to fall into public aircraft or civil aircraft? What's what's the thing? Well, the uh, drones are considered aircraft, therefore, all of the federal aviation regulations apply. Okay. However, not all of the federal aviation regulations apply to public aircraft, which uh, a couple of the big ones are: the pilot license requirement, the medical certificate requirement the airworthiness certificate required and standards and maintenance and ongoing, uh, you know, upkeep of that aircraft. That's because that the Congress, when they originally created all this, allowed it so that the, the agency could really do what it needs to do. Like, we're not going to tell you how you can train your F-16 fighter pilots. Just go train them and go up, blow up the enemy. Like, go do your thing. You guys develop your own standards and you self-certify. So just because you're in a public aircraft, you know, doesn't mean you, like, should not uh, develop. It's not like a get out of standards set up here because the FAA could actually fall back on saying, well, you're actually operating carelessly and recklessly in the national airspace. And that regulation does apply to public aircraft operations because you don't have any standards. Like what's to keep this drone or whatever falling out of the sky and killing someone on the ground. So you need to have some type of standards, but it makes your life a whole lot easier as opposed to currently for at least the, the civilian guys, they have to go and get a sport certificate at a minimum to go to do commercial operations. Well, if you're, you get classified as a public aircraft operation, you just can self certify. So come up with some standards, self certify, boom, you're done. FA is not going to ask any more uh, questions. Now it's operation. Also I want to clarify that not based upon the aircraft or the person 
or any of that. So you could have the same drone being flown by the same fire department for firefighting purposes. That would be considered public aircraft. But then if the the fire chief's like, yo, I want some like really good video of like my kid's birthday party. And you go over there and take some footage of the, you know, the, the fire department goes over there and takes some footage of that. That would be considered not a governmental function. I mean, you don't really hire fire departments to come and take pictures of birthday parties. So that phase like, eh, you know, that's a civilian aircraft operation. Therefore, all of the regulations apply. Therefore, uh, you are, um, you're going to have to have a pilot certificate. So that, that's kind of one interesting point there. Now, when uh, the FAA has kind of clarified this area, um, it's you go to the statutes, it's really clear. They list some of the government operations, but it's not a completely exhaustive list. It says such as. So you, you, can, you can get other things, and that's what the FAA is doing over time is they're kind of interpreting, yeah, this is governmental, this is not. So some of the things that are definitely governmental intelligence missions, firefighting, search and rescue, law enforcement, including transporting prisoners, detainees. Okay, this is back. This was all done 1958, guys. So drones really weren't on the horizon as much as they are now. Aeronautical research, biological and geological resource management. And then uh, some of these universities started asking questions saying, hey, well, what about education? You know, we have all these like public universities. Uh, isn't that kind of like a governmental function? And the FAA actually said, no, no you, flight, uh, flight instructing education is not considered a governmental function. So therefore, they could not obtain a COA to do flight instructing of their students on unmanned aircraft. However, they could go get a COA to do aeronautical research. Uh, and that would be primarily along the lines of, um, of Think of like, you know, how NASA comes up with these like weird, funny shaped aircraft and they paint them crazy colors and oh, does this fly? Let's test it. You know, that's aeronautical research. Not, I'm going to do aeronautical research over my kid's birthday party, right? No, no, that's not aeronautical research. <laughs> so um, th there has to be kind of like a real bona fide you know, point there. And so another just that's a quick question here, Jonathan, real quick. So just uh, for clarification, so we have an MOU with NOAA and uh, NOAA, one of their main units they, uh, they utilize in our area is the Puma, Aero Environments Puma. Um, so we can go out on missions with them and help out and do stuff, but we're not allowed to, to be the pilot because those guys, to, to um, you know, whatever, whoever you are, if you want to use the Puma, you have to go to a flight school, three-week flight school at um, a military base back east. And I, it sounds like that's because they're not allowed to operate a flight school. So because the, the units are utilized by the, uh, one version of the units are utilized by the military, the way they've gotten around that is they just said, hey, all you guys gotta go to the military training, even though the people aren't, aren't military per se. But, well, also it could have been that the FAA and the uh, NOAA also said, well, our standards are you have to go to that training. And then that's how they self-certified everything. Um, because, I mean, you, you, they could, you can technically kind of train your own guys for purposes of like, you know, in-house kind of stuff, but it's a different, it's, it's different training your guys in-house than holding out to the public and just accepting anybody, uh, you know, out there because that's the point of training. You're better at what you do, not just, I'm teaching you how to fly, you know, because you're teaching the guys how to fight fires, you know, better or do search and rescue better, not just general everybody come in the door here's a degree that that fade does not buy that but if you actually go back to uh this point right here it says where does it say uh b right here it says crew training so you can have an aircraft that's owned by the government and operated by a person for purposes related to crew training equipment development or demonstration okay except as provided in uh 4125b um, so there is a possibility for that. It's just might be, that's how the COA is set up. Not so much as a legal, you know, thing. It might have insurance or something else like that. That's, that might've been what was included in the COA. Like everyone's got to be certified by this guy. So that's why they just outsourced all the training. Um, now, now, okay. Now there's some interesting issues regarding uh, intra-state agency or intra-government contracting. You know, so you could have some situations where um, agencies uh, it, it, within the federal government can just contract with each other to do government work. So let's say uh, NOAA doesn't 
uh, no, Noah has a drone and FEMA wants it. So then Noah and FEMA, so FEMA could actually just fly under Noah's COA and do it like that if, if they want to. But then when they actually go to a state, there's some interesting little issues there. Um, but now if you guys are working under Noah, you could probably be, that could, I think work, but then, because this gets into a really weird gray area, and depending on what time of day you ask the guy, and if he has indigestion, you'll get one answer. Uh, I'm, I'm yes, just I, kidding. we've realized that. <laughs> yeah, I mean, like, so, like, one, when dealing with the government, uh, it is very, 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 very important to be as nice and cordial and just you know, butter the people up as much as you can on the phone. You know, thank you so much for talking to me. I really appreciate it. Thank you. You're such an awesome, wonderful public servant. I truly am grateful for, you know, honored by you taking the time out of your busy schedule to talk to me. Yeah, do that. It'll go a lot better for you, I've learned. Um, Native American tribes, they can't get public aircraft status. Uh, and last point here, public works. If, like, Tennessee Valley Authority... That was that was created way back when to actually uh, maintain these dams, infrastructure, power, blah blah blah, a lot of that stuff. It was created by Congress. It had a mission. Okay, it's an entity. It's actually a cor- it's a uh, it's a corporation, um, and it was created specifically to fulfill some governmental purpose. And the FAA actually was like, "Hey, well, you're not in this little category, but your government created to do a government purpose." And the whole idea behind public aircraft operations is. Like, we need to let you do what you need to do without messing with you. So they actually held the TVA could use drones for aircraft and uh, for uh, dam inspection. I'm actually working right now on a COA for um, an airport. You know, it's a government-created airport, uh, and they're wanting to use it for inspections. So you can see how this, it'll, it'll morph over time. And if you want to get in these weird gray areas, contact an attorney to try to uh, – it's kind of like getting a crowbar and jamming in the door and opening the door. Like, come on, let me in. Like Kind of like that uh, – was it the shining? Like, here's Johnny, you know, <laughs> it's kind of what you need when you actually do uh, legal work with agencies. You just got to ram it over and over until you get it uh, done. Then uh, lastly, so you have the ownership set up, then you have the government purpose set up. You have to fall into one of those categories. Last part, you cannot have any type of reimbursement whatsoever to the uh, government. There's only one exception to that. It's for like military type of flights, uh, but that doesn't apply to pretty much everybody. Uh, now, that's money going to the guy, uh, the, the, the agency that has the drones or the co okay? It doesn't mean that the agency can't subcontract pilots to fly under them. Money can leave the agency, but it can't go towards the agency because at that point you're operating just like a, a commercial airlines kind of, right? Like little Delta, like, hey, who wants, to, who wants some drone footage of their, you know, their kid's birthday party? <laughs> you can't do that. So. Uh, couple things. Um, FAA does not regulate the certification of government aircraft. FAA only re- regulates the operation operation of public aircraft. And so you can tell which regulations do apply and which don't because it's kind of like all over the all over the area. Look at like 91, 91.7 here. It says no person may operate a civil aircraft. See that word civil aircraft? That means public aircraft don't have to comply with the air in this thing right here. See that? But you get a 91-113 right away rules. Vigilance shall be maintained by each person operating an aircraft. Well, aircraft means all aircraft. There you go. Which one argues, you know, how many of these aircraft ones that uh, that are out there that the really apply to model aircraft, but then the FAA selectively chooses to flip them on and off like light switches. Uh, like, oh, it's on. Now it's off. Now it's on. Now it's off. Which is what they did it with the... Uh, special flight rules area around DC. I don't know if you saw that, where it was like, you know, two months, like two, three months ago, they're like, Hey, nobody fly. Nobody fly. Ah, uh, green light. Yeah, we got you. I got you. You can fly now. <laughs> and they publish a, a no TAM. And so now I guess we can go fly again uh, until they turn it back off. So um, public aircraft, they need a COA. Okay. And it's best to get the COA thing going before you actually need one. And if you actually have a COA for a different aircraft or um, different location, what you can actually do is get an emergency COA, but you have to have a COA already in place. So that can actually um, uh, change the location. So let's say Noah wants to do some research firefighting or something, I don't know, with the Department of Interior, then they could switch their COA over under the emergency COA process, different location and use the Puma 
for like some firefighting efforts. So there's some creative ways you can do stuff. So, 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 recap. Did, so, the, so the emergency COA, I, I've not heard of that before. So the emergency COA is uh, something that you call up the FAA and they give it to you within a couple hours. Is it like a depredation permit or can you get it? Is it after the fact, if there was a fire, you went and served it, you have to get it beforehand. What, what's the deal with the emergency COA? Um, it, <laughs> it depends on how big of an emergency it is. Because <laughs> if it's a big of an emergency, I think some people just go, oh, just fly. What the heck, you know? Um, generally, you're both, well, okay, supposed to get it beforehand. Uh, now, you're going to give them update them like, hey, this is a new location. This is what we're going to do. If there's a temporary flight restriction, it makes your life a whole lot easier because nobody's coming in the bubble unless, you know, the controlling agency is allowing them. So if you're in coordination with them, uh, the controlling agency, well, you know, th that'll make your life a lot easier with getting an emergency code to come out of D.C. There's three uh, primary service areas, and each one is like a specific point of contact. You make a phone call to him and get the ball rolling. And those can go from a couple hours to maybe a day or more before you get one. Uh, so that's generally like as soon as you find out about something, you would want to call and get that ball rolling with the new coordinates. And that's why you have to have a previous code already in place because you're really just updating – the location, like everything's the same. You know, we're doing everything the same, just new location. Okay, okay, you're good. That's kind of the, that's kind of the idea behind it. Now, uh, government aircraft owned, used, or leased within the definitions uh, must be fulfilling a core governmental function, and you can't make any money. Uh, civil aircraft, recreational, that's an individual receiving no direct or indirect benefit. And if you're non-recreational, which is businesses, groups, direct or indirect benefit, you, you, you hit any of those, you automatically go into the non-recreational aircraft. Uh, 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 aircraft category, which means all the regulations that apply. That's kind of how you break it all down. So how does a drone actually get permission to fly since we kind of like briefly talked about all this? Um, government aircraft, they can go get a COA. They can also go get a 333 if they want. That's a, There is a possibility. They can also get a special air within a certificate in the experimental category. They can pretty much do whatever they want because they're free to do what they want regarding standards. So they either make their own standards or adopt the FAA standards. Okay. Civil guys don't have that option. It's just, you know, here you go, FA standards. Um, so the couple benefits to that, uh, why you would want to go the 333 route. Uh, well, 333 is good for the entire United States. So is the blanket COA that comes with it. While your COAs that you normally get for all these like governmental purposes, blah, 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 you're normally li limited to a geographic region. So if you have a, uh, let's say you're into the firefighting thing again, you got to go get the ECOA to go over there. Well, under the 333, you can quickly make a phone call, file a NOTAM, wait 24 hours, and then just go over there and fly. You only have a 24-hour wait period. So some people kind of like that uh, that, uh, that ability to do that. Um, and uh, you can also do things outside of your normal governmental functions. So let's say the fire department wants to do firefighting and on the weekends take pictures of kids' birthday parties to raise funds for a new fire truck. They would need to go get a 333, okay, and then they would operate under that in a, kind of this commercial, non-government way, and then that's how they can raise money to, uh, uh, to, 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 to do that. They could actually have both if they want. They can hold two different things. Now, civil aircraft, okay, your, their, your way to get airborne, uh, the air within a certificate, they're standard and special. To date, nobody has a standard air within a certificate uh, that has been developed. I know they are working on a few. There's a few of them that are currently working right now, but that's a lot of money and time. Special air within certificates, you have two primary ones that have been getting used. Experimental, which is primarily training, research, market development, certain stuff like that for uh, um uh, that's primarily what your Puma is going to, you guys, did, did you guys have a special evidence certificate in the experimental or did you just go straight up COA with the one with the Puma? Okay. So you just did that route. Okay. So like BNSF railways, uh, they've been using the, uh, scan Eagle and they're using the scan Eagle under the restricted category here. Okay. Not the experimental because this can be used in a broader area than the experimental category for seeding, forestry, spraying, dusting, wildlife, aerial surveying, patrolling, blah, blah, blah. Big problem with that restricted category is it has to be previously uh, certified under a standard air rhythm certificate. So uh, Aurora Flight Sciences actually converted a DA-42 to be unmanned. So since it had an air rhythm certificate previously, it could go under a restricted category. And then with the Puma, 
Uh, the reason the, the Puma and the Scan Eagle can both go into the restricted category for civil uh, commercial operations is because they were both certified under military standards. But you got to be, that's, that's the hard part. It's like this little loophole. You have to be certified. Then you can get restricted category. You can't just come up with like some brand new drill, like a Phantom. Phantom can't ever get restricted category because it's never been certified by anyone anywhere. Uh, so that's not going to work. Now, how is everyone actually getting airborne and making dough? Uh, section 333 exemptions. Okay. So uh, everyone's like thinking there's some type of exemption power in Section 333. Well, where does the Section 333 thing come from? FAA Modernization Reform Act of 2012. It gives the FAA the power to determine whether a certificate of waiver, certificate of authorization, or error in a certification uh, will be required. So it's, it's, it's a misnomer because there is no exemption powers in Section 333. So where does this like little exemption thing actually come from? It actually comes from the Part 11 exemption process and like how it actually this whole thing works it's like a legal cocktail where they take section 333 and then they say hey your phantom does not need an error within a certificate okay so then a bunch of regulations go right out the door uh, especially a lot of them regarding error within this uh, uh with the maintenance and, and uh, maintaining error within this because you have no error within a certificate to maintain therefore the you know maintenance boop, out the door makes your life simple how do you get rid of the last of the, you know, the remaining regulations that are difficult to comply with? Because remember, your drone is considered an aircraft, therefore all the federal aviation regulations do apply. They take care of them under the Part 11 exemption process, and three of them are taken care of under the waiver process from uh, Part 91, which one wonders why in the world do we do that? I think it's job protection for the Air Traffic Organization Office, but you know, you mentioned that around DC and someone will kill you. Um, but anyways, uh, so to date, we've had, well, see, I did this a little while back, this presentation. We actually have over, I think it's like 3,200 um, exemptions have been uh, uh, done. And I think the process rate was around 33% last I looked that have been rejected. Um, so that, that's generally what it looks like. Also, by the way, COA is another misnomer. So it's like Section 333 and COA are both misnomers. Certificate of authorization is only for certain regulations that specifically say authorization. You're not getting an authorization. You're getting actually in a waiver. So you, technically, you're getting a cow. Um, but nobody knows what in the world. If you uh, if you said I have a cow, they might think other things. And if you, <laughs> but they uh, they they don't. That is actually not the, the technical term because in the regulations, uh, there's there's deviations, authorizations, uh, and exemptions, and um, there's like four total, and all four of them mean completely different things regulatorily wise. However, you and I would just speak, you know, in everyday speak like they were completely interchangeable, synonymous, right? But they're not, and it's just kind of sloppy. If you want to get really precise, it, you get cows, and you use the Section 333 process with the Part 11 process with a cow to become operational commercially. So uh, that's how that works. Um, and I already kind of explained that. Uh, oh, brief thing about the Part 11 exemption process. It's like a teeter-totter, best way to describe it. It's the equivalent level of safety. So if you kind of balance on one side, the federal aviation regulations and the safety they provide. Okay. And then on your side, you go, okay, uh, my manuals, my standards, all this stuff provide the same equivalent level of safety. Then the FAA, if they, they look at that and said, yeah, it's about the equivalent, then you'll be granted an exemption. So once again, remember with the, the uh, government guys, they, they are free to actually just go and make their own standards. With the civilian side, you can go and make your own standards and propose them to the FAA under the Part 11 exemption process, and they might agree with you. And then uh, you can operate under that because certain things are just too difficult to comply with. And you're like, hey, we need to get around this, but we'll get the same end goal. FAA just cares about safety. That's all they want. They don't care how you get there. They just want safety, lots of it. So a um, couple things. Why would a public entity get a 3 through 3 flight instruction, education, reporting, like news gathering, and one wonders why, uh, you know, it, like, it makes sense, because the First Amendment is to protect citizens from government for exercising the First Amendment right to news gather, which kind of indic it, it indicates that that's not a governmental function, because why else would people be, why is it talking about the people and its protection from the government for that? Um, subsidized precision ag for farmers, commercial research, private security, that's all, um, 
stuff that you would have to go get a three, 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 four. If an agency wanted to make some extra cash on the side, uh, full grants versus summer grants. Um, currently the summer grants, summer grants, there's only two ways they're giving those out. You have aerial data collection, uh, under the three, three, three process. It's pretty much gathering data from the sky with the sensor. It's so broad. Now close at TV filming is the other one. That's where you want to get within 500 feet of people. They're functionally pretty much the same, you know, like what's the difference between a guy flying over a field and a guy flying over some actors on a movie set. They're gathering data with the sensor. The big difference is that with the closed set TV movie film setup, you got to get within 500 feet of the actors, right? So remember good old 91, uh, 119 subsection C, right guys? The whole little 500 foot bubble rule, stay away from whatever you don't own uh, setup. Well, if you need to get within those close to those actors, you're going to violate those regs. So actually back in the 80s, this waiver process with the, they, uh, the Motion Picture Association of America and FA got together and created a standardized manual uh, set up and you get that motion picture manual and you put it with your exemption petition, you submit it all, that will give you the equivalent level of safety. So once again, it's a legal cocktail. Manuals from the 80s, exemption process, 333 from 2012. It's just like all craziness thrown together to make everything legal. That's kind of how it works. Um, now that's, those are two options for the summary grant process. So if you apply for a section 333 exemption, yes, for one of those, uh, you'll get there pretty quick. Now, if you want to go do other things, you can, but that phase is going to do a little bit more in depth uh, research into what's going on. And so if you want to, everything that would fall into that would be like flight instruction, research and development, banner towing, crop spraying, repair and testing, uh, payload delivery. Those would, those would be those. Now to date, um, outside of aerial data collection and closed set, there has been crop dusting has been approved. Over 55 pound operations have been approved. Uh, flight instruction has been approved. And then this one where it was like a closed set athletic filming uh, has been approved, which didn't really seem too much of a difference than closed set TV movie filming other than it was just like athletic. So I didn't really know what the functional difference was there. It was pretty much the same. But on the flight instruction, on the flight instruction, Jonathan, only, only one, I thought it's only like one entity has gotten that exemption, right? Correct. And I have four pending. So hopefully I will have number two, three, four, and five under my belt. All right, cool. cool, cool, cool. I'm currently working on that right now. Um, with some other individuals. Uh, once again, kind of going with the whole process, we were all uh, working on a flight instruction book together, like drone flight instruction, and that is going to be getting published soon. So we're kind of having that and all of that kind of like surfacing at the same time uh, is what the goal is on uh, the next couple. Um, because there's a, there's a massive need for, uh, you know, universities, major companies and stuff to do that. We're kind of, that that's what the goal we're going to, you know, kind of go around, set up, flight schools and people and stuff, uh, chief pilots, so that way we can step away and there's some standards. Uh, coming from a manned aviation side of things, not like the uh, hobby bro mentality that seems to be kind of pervasive in the industry right now. Of Instead of like, how safe can I be? They kind of do like, how cool would this be? And when they fly their aircraft, it's, it's two different mindsets, two different complete cultures on safety. So we come from the man side of things. Everybody's at a minimum a commercial pilot. Uh, on the book we're doing and in that group but anyways um some of the the, the 333 restrictions that are that are going on here is 100 mile per hour max speed 400 foot uh above ground uh level you cannot do any type of um fpv racing it's visual line of sight but one could actually argue you know you are within visual line of sight right because you know, I, it doesn't say I have to have the drone in sight, like actually looking at it all the time. It's just, you know, if it's 10 feet away. That's in my line of sight. I can see 10 feet away, right? But you know, anyways, that's a whole other little fun argument we could have with the FAA. You could have, you have to have a sport pilot's license, a driver's license. You have to do a pre-flight inspection. Uh, you must have a visual observer and that must be a guy separate than the cameraman. So the cinematography guys do generally at a minimum three people, sometimes four when they go do their uh, Hollywood setups. I have a bunch of Hollywood guys um, and that's how they, they run their shows, three to four people each each time. So they have higher overhead. Um, no night flying. You can't fly too close to airports. Depends on the airport for the distance. 500 foot below cloud, yeah, your general VFR stuff, you know, the three, 152 setup. Um, so can I, I just have one quick thing. So that, that's the default 333, right? You can request a night 
uh, night uh, flight if you have a reason to? Uh, yeah. Well, I, there has been at least one guy that requested it. He got denied. Well, he didn't get denied. That they asked him questions and they never said anything back. Um, but I'm currently working on another night exemption. That wasn't mine, but I'm working on night uh, and some other ones. I'll kind of explain because these are like the general stock restrictions. You can petition for something outside of that, but you're gonna have to present to the FAA like a safety case study showing like you have an equivalent level of safety. Those are the buzzwords, equivalent level of safety. Um, uh -huh. Yeah, so you say airport by miles. Um, one of the things that's come up recently is like heliports. So uh, yeah, where do you stand on those right now? We have a ton of heliports. <laughs> ah, yes, yes. And you guys are aware of the guy that got arrested in North Carolina for flying near a heliport that was private and it wasn't even listed on the sectional chart? Mm. Yep. Mm. Yep. What, the, what was up with that? Like, what was up? I don't know. But that's the, the general rule of thumb is this is what the FAA says and go above and beyond and not get in trouble. And then the fallback to all of this, the general rule is don't get caught anyways but uh <laughs> um i mean that's step one guys don't get caught um and if you have a name tag you say something like sean anderson or something like that you know put that on the drone and fly it you know and then oh crud cops come and run and then call me or sean will call me either one of you call me i'll have you i'll have a two for one deal it'll be great anyways so um uh Heliports, yeah, they, you have a, that is a serious issue because also there is a guy um, who is being prosecuted in L.A. and he had a similar situation for flying near, I believe it was LAPD's uh, heliport, which is on the third story. The, the He's flying the drone and the helicopter's coming in and it's not on the sectional and it's private. So how is he really supposed to be on notice of not where to fly there? So this is your... Uh, I don't, the answer is just stay away from them. So do you find out where they are and stay away from them? So this, once again, remember, this is with the FAA, not with the states, because North Carolina is monkeying around. You have a uh, sea of LA is monkeying around thinking they, they can regulate the airspace when they cannot. Uh, this stuff's all been answered in courts, um, you know, many decades ago, but people are either ignorant or they're tyrants is basically how I boiled it down. So it's like, you don't either know or bother putting effort into actually researching this or you're, you're a tyrant. Uh, most of the actually attorneys that know, most of the attorneys learn this stuff when we took constitutional law back in law school. So you kind of tell this to an attorney that the state's regulating airspace. And they just kind of like look at you going like, yeah, they can't do that. And you're like, yeah, I know they can't, but they, they are. And then the poor people get arrested and prosecuted under these things. You know, New York city, quite a few people have been arrested uh, that I've talked to. And they, those guys aren't getting prosecuted under, like, drone laws from the state. They're getting prosecuted under, like, tr uh, stuff that, that's already on the books, like trespassing, noise ordinances, uh, careless and reckless operation of something. And they're kind of, like, taking those ones and applying it to the drone guys. Yeah, so some people have said that uh, the problem is when you have your, your 333, let's say, that you violated your restrictions on 333. And that, um, not that I'm encouraging anyone to do anything illegal, but that uh, exactly your point, that if you didn't have the, that, that uh, exemption or, or, or cow or whatever, you would just be, because the law is vague, you, that's what happens. It's trespassing, it's, it's uh, um, you know, illegal photography or something like that. Right, well, that's actually a really interesting argument there because, uh, but, but, uh, I think the two guys are getting prosecuted. Actually, most of all the guys that are getting prosecuted, I know of right now are all getting prosecuted because they were flying in recreationally. So you don't really have a situation where I, I don't know of any, where they were operating commercially and then got prosecuted under state laws of some sort. They were all operating recreationally and that's how it was happening. You know, so it's, uh, there's some interesting, you know, that that's going to be determined coming up here, you know, with, with some litigation. Uh, and hopefully, yeah, it, that'll be determined sometime in the next uh, year to two years uh, for some courts on on that. Just basically tell them to knock it off. Um, here's a whole bunch more restrictions. They've changed over time. Battery uh, requirement. Used, it's, right now it's five minutes. Uh, used to be actually 25%, and then it went to 30%, and then it went to five minutes. And that was actually kind of bad for the cinematography guys because like a free flight Alta, 
it lifts like a red camera for cinematography and that that guy has like about an eight minute battery life uh, flying a red camera so you like yeah yeah that's not a yeah that's not a lot of time man three minutes to go get your shot legally while if they would have kept it at the 25 percent setup you know it, that would have been a better you know way to do it and most of these shots it's like I mean, you know, the whole 30, 30 minute thing for VFR and all that, the idea is like there's, you know, airports kind of far away, right? You have to like kind of get in the pattern and land and you just can't land. While with drones, it's just like, why don't, yeah, you can just land anywhere. Like, why, why, why do we have that kind of, that setup? But they're trying to stick close to the equivalent level of safety as the regulations apply. I think that was a stupid way to do it. They should have kept it at the percentage because it unnecessarily goofed over the cinematography guys. Um, let's see. Uh, quickest I've ever seen a 333 go through was 57 days. And when I did this presentation, that was a long time ago. It Today, is, you're running around 120 to 180 days, uh, not 70 to 80 days. Um, so, yeah, it, everything's kind of changed. The Texas, California, and Florida are like the three dominating the, the exemptions right now. Florida actually just took first place, I think, last month. Uh, th that's where all the exemption holders primarily are, or at least... That, that must be your doing. <laughs> huh? huh? That must be your doing. Oh, no. I, I wish it was. Um, I wish it was. Uh, so then here's kind of a breakdown of the stuff that people have asked for. But this is only up to date as of June the 8th, by the way. Uh, there's no real data I have after that. But you can kind of see where it breaks down generally surveying, mapping, industrial inspections, and real estate photography, which is almost impossible under the exemptions because you have to stay at least 500 feet away from property and people. So it becomes very difficult to actually comply with that. So I think what's happening is a lot of people are just going and getting their three through three saying I'm three through three compliant and they're either ignorant or they are fraudulently just telling people this, even though they don't plan on actually complying with any of the restrictions in the three through three, which that seems to be the pretty big pervasive problem right now in the industry. Now aircraft requested DJI is just like totally owning uh, the area. It's just DJI. They they they're really owning it. Um, and I haven't really seen too much since. Now maybe Unique might come up and start taking out more and more as time goes on because uh, they're kind of developing products that are uh, doing everything here, but a little bit better. So now current enforcement. Well, Raphael Perker, then FA went after him for a ten thousand dollar fine. He was not flying. It, 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 they were going after him not because he was flying commercial, but when you are commercial, therefore, the FAA believes that all the regulations apply. So they went after him for violating 9113, the whole careless and reckless thing. So they, they really picked the low-hanging fruit in this case and went after the careless and reckless. They didn't go after any of the other issues of, okay, he's an unlicensed guy, unregistered aircraft, no air within a certificate. Why didn't you go after those? No, it's the simple one. 9113 is what they picked. So uh, after the Perker case, you had another one, uh, David Zabladowski who flew, uh, he's, a, he's a bassist in an 80s cover band called Rubik's Cube. See, rock you like a hurricane. <laughs> anyway, so uh, he flew his Phantom in uh, Midtown Manhattan, basically did uh, bumper cars with some uh, buildings until one of the props broke and the Phantom crashed. FAA cited him for 9113 and also flying in Class B airspace without a clearance. Yeah, that's an interesting twist of events because nowhere in any of the documents that were issued to uh, on how a model aircraft guy should be flying said anything about flying, you know the the whole class B um, uh, clearance issue. You know, with class Bravo and Charlie, you have to get the two A radio contact thing going, but class Bravo is the clearance. So it kind of seems like they go, hey, hey, do this, but if you actually follow the guidance documents that the FA gives you would actually be violating the regulations. So they kind of like selectively, you know, hold this against you and then they flip it on whenever they want. And that, the Zabodowski case is really good evidence of that. Now from July, 2004 to December, 2014, I don't have any other newer uh, numbers than these. Um, you had a total of 18 enforcement actions that went on, uh, verbal conversations, uh, were 14 letters that were sent out. There was 80 and then 105 cases were closed because there was insufficient info uh, for an investigation. So, so what, what, is letters, what does letters sent mean? Oh, those are warning letters. Like, hey, you guys, 
can't be doing this. You know, like, yeah, got to go get your Section 333 exemption, blah, blah, blah. It's a warning letter is what they're sending out. They sent out at least 80 of them. Now, this is only for like a six-month time frame back in 2014. Now, there's probably a whole lot more stuff going on. It's just that they is starting to ramp up a little bit more um, around that time frame. Now, those 18 enforcement actions, this is how they broke down. Uh, one pilot license suspension is what they were trying to do. A pilot license suspension. Let me let that sink in. A pilot license suspension. So if you have a pilot's license and you're flying drones, you better be careful because you stand to lose more than Raphael Perker was just getting fined for uh, you know $10,000 because then that they could go find you and pull your pilot's license. And they could pull your exemption and your COA if they want to also which is not cool because the pilot's bill of rights protects only your pilot's license. It does not protect you from the FAA pulling your COAs or your exemptions. That's kind of a problem actually, if you want to make money, but I mean, I like making money. Do you guys like making money? <laughs> um, no action letters of correction. There was one, uh, there was five warnings and then uh, nine civil penalties were recommended. Since I got this data, I have found out that there has been a, there's at least 20 enforcement uh, civil penalty actions actually going on now, from nine to 20 uh, within about a year. So it's starting to ramp up. Um, Skypan is the big one everyone uh, has heard about for the 1.9 million dollars. And in addition to FAA kind of causing problems in the states, you have other federal agencies that are causing problems. Uh, NOAA they sent a warning letter to a guy on YouTube for flying too close to whales because there's like this marine protection mammal blah 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 acts don't fly near whales unless you get permits you can you just got to get permits and it's a pain yeah we, uh, we, we actually we actually have such a permit for work in hawaii oh Ooh, okay cool i should come over there and hang out with you we get some whale footage uh, we could do free willy three the uh you could film that it'll be great i'll get my cinematography guys to come over um veterans affairs Man was fined for flying his drone near a VA hospital, uh, National Park Service. People don't know that actually Parker prior to – actually, it was, I think it was three months, I think it was after the whole um, University of Virginia incident, he actually was fined by the National Park Service for flying in Grand Canyon. Um, so, yeah, and they yeah they, and then the National Park Service issued some memos saying you can't take off and land – uh, in the parks. However, they don't control the airspace. So you could technically go off park, fly the drone over park, take picture of stuff in park, then fly back and land off park. That would be permissible, but oh, not really? you know, taking off or landing. Well, that's good to know. Park, park, <laughs> which, but one wonders, but one wonders why you can't just like hand launch it then. Right. I'm not landing or taking it off in the park, you know, but what, you know, I mean, we're getting really like, it's getting interesting now. So, uh, DOI has also sent out some uh, warning uh, letters to individuals flying near wildlife habitats. Um, so yeah, Fif tons of states have all get uh, gotten in this. It's it's like tickle me Elmo of the law, you know, Cabbage Patch Kids. Remember where everybody had to have one for Christmas? That's what happened. Everybody's been like passing bills, getting into it. Uh, they don't know what they're doing, but they they want to do it. And it'll all be cleaned up by the next guy that comes into office. So what do they care, right? Pass some laws and then leave. Uh, local governments, they've also been um, passing all sorts of uh, ordinances. They've actually been kind of like finding ordinances that have been in the books for like the 80s. That, that's happened here in the South Florida area. It's don't fly your model airplanes or aircraft near parks and stuff like that. And they kind of uh, discover, well, stuff that's been hidden for a long time and start applying them. Or they're just coming up straight up, just passing them just completely banning them or saying you have to have insurance or permits, stuff like that. Uh, these are the things the police have been doing, trespassing, noise ordinance, disturbing the peace, careless, reckless behavior. Those are the crimes people are being charged with uh, that are non like drone related. So it's like the guys that are flying their drones. They are charging them with these crimes that don't really say anything specifically to, you know, regarding drones. Uh, the future. These are all the stuff, these are all the acts and just lots and lots of paperwork that applies to creating regulations. So when we get the APA, the Federal Register Act, Federal Advisory Committee Act, Regulatory Flexibility Act, blah, blah, blah. We have executive orders. We have Office Manager Budget has a document. DOT has a document. All these hoops, I mean, it's more than a circus. And so 
Drones, uh, the FAA is creating a uh, commercial drone uh, set of regulations called Part 107. And this is what the internal rulemaking process looks like. We have actually actually passed through this. We are, we're past this right now. And we are currently, for at least Part 107, we are in right here. It has not even, as of uh, last night I checked, it has not even left the FAA to the Department of Transportation for review. And after DOT reviews, it has to go to Office Management and Budget. Then it has to go to Office Information Regulatory Affairs in the Office of Management and Budget. They have to do an analysis under the Regulatory Flexibility Act, a bunch of stuff. There's like all these like little guys on the totem pole all through here. If anybody, any single stinking buddy says no, automatically goes back to uh, the FAA. So it's like, remember video games where you play the bad, you know, the master bad guy and uh, uh, you, know, you, you don't get him and he, he kills you somehow and you go to the beginning of the level and you're like, man, that was annoying. It's what the regulatory process is. You just don't go back to where you were. You have to now go back to Office of Secretary of Transportation, OMB, OIRA. You have to do that over and over and over and over and over and over and over again until everybody's happy with it. So I estimate the commercial rules coming out at least six months to maybe two years uh, from now. I mean, some of these regulations have actually taken 10 years or more to uh, promulgate. Uh, this whole thing was started in 2009, by the way, and it was only published as of a year ago in the Federal Register, which uh, uh, was right here. This was a year, actually, right, see, right back here, 2009, February last year was right here, and now we're right here. And it's like, you really notice OST? And all these things that I'm that I have right here are are like they had to do that from 2009 to 2000 and like uh, 15. So you guys really think this is getting done anytime soon? I do not. Um, some of the important parts of the notice of proposed rulemaking: um, 100 mile per hour max, 500 foot above ground level. You can go in class Bravo, Charlie, Delta, and Echo airspace. With ATC permission, uh, you basically take kind of its equivalent of a knowledge test, and you, once you pass that, you send it off. Eight weeks later, you get your test back in the mail after the TSA has done a background check, and one wonders if that eight you know weeks is really going to grow astronomically, probably because everybody and their dog is going to want this you know uh, pilot certificate. So it might be beneficial if you already have a pilot certificate to go to your local FISDO and see if they can add this on because you passed the knowledge exam. You can skip the whole thing, you know. Anyways. Uh, uh, don't need an air within a certificate, and it's a small unmanned aircraft rating. It's an unmanned aircraft certificate with a small unmanned aircraft rating. So you can kind of see maybe they're building into this, maybe some type of like instrument, you know, beyond visual line of sight kind of setup rating, right? Or night rating or 55 pound and heavier rating or something like that. So those are some of the interesting parts because notice the, the, the proposed rulemaking did not cover night operations. Beyond visual, line beyond visual line of sight operations, 55 pound and heavier operations, or 500 foot and, or higher you know, altitudes. Uh, so if you want to go these routes, you're going back to the Section 333 route or the SACAC route uh, or the Publicola route. So, yeah. Um, any questions? Cool. Well, let's first thank John. That was great. So you guys want to stretch a little bit, but does anybody have any questions they want to ask before we uh, let let the expert go? Chase, is there any difference? Wait, maybe walk over so you can hear easier on the microphone. Is there any difference in the exemptions if the uh, UAV is not powered by a motor? Uh, well, well, if you're like, Did you hear that one, John? What's it? Are, are you talking, are you talking like, like a balloon, balloon or something like that? I mean, if it's, no, like, a glider, if it's uh, like a glider, uh, glider. Oh, a glider. Oh, um, the FAA would consider that an aircraft still. Um, it, it's it's primarily under the you know the airplane category. So yeah, the, the FAA would still. They might treat it differently because recently they they had some questions regarding tethered aircraft. The FAA said hold off on that, and they answered it saying you could do tethered aircraft. So they probably would throw that into that same category. Uh, you know, one, one thing you could do is just tell them that it's a glider and then they might just let it pass on through and not ask any questions. So Thank just, you. just try it. Cool. Other, other questions you guys have? Everybody's, everybody's, okay, so uh, 
So I'll just ask one last final quick one. Um, the two laws that were just introduced in the Congress, do you know, any, I don't really know much about them. Do you know anything about those uh, overviews of those proposals? Yeah, uh, well, okay, so they're just bills, okay, okay. but <laughs> could go somewhere and do something. Everybody is trying to get something in or out of them. A uh, couple of things that I noticed, uh, both were asking for insurance requirements of drone operators. Uh, they did not have any explicit uh, clauses regarding preemption, which would have been helpful to tell the cities, towns, county, states to knock it off with drone regulations. So we're still going to have that problem. Uh, and uh, there is no provision in there saying, FAA, if you do not do such and such by such and such a date, we're going to cut your funding until you, to you do do it. Because what's the FAA's fallback? Like, well, why didn't you get it done, Mr. FAA? Um, safety? Oh, crap, I can't defeat that. So that's their fallback. There's no teeth to actually force the FAA to, um, uh, to do this. So, I, I mean, it's great, but I don't know. I don't know where it's going to go from here. I, I don't pay attention to that too much because it hasn't gone through the process enough to where uh, we could um, actually see something come out because it's just a bill. There's been a lot of bills. I mean, Cory Booker had a bill. Feinstein had a bill. Schumer had a bill. Everybody's had a bill. It's it's like tickle me Elmo of the law, right? Of the federal guys. It's everyone's got to do one and be cool, but nothing's actually come to fruition. All those fizzled out, and everyone thought they were going to be like kind of these uh, savior type of um, bills, you know, like oh we're going to get commercial and operational, blah blah blah. We're gonna make money and. Nothing happened. It fizzled out. So that's what I kind of feel is going to happen with these two bills. It's going to be a lot of like, it's, it's Roman candle law, man. You, yeah. you light it, right? Yeah. Boom, 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 boom. Oh, that's awesome. that's awesome. And then it's like out. And then it's like, well, that was into that. Give me another one, right? Right. Cool. All right, great. Uh, why don't we thank Jonathan one more time. And uh, I'll follow up with you after, man. Thanks so much. This was great. Thanks so much for the time. We appreciate it. Hey, thank you so much. I appreciate it also. All right, great. Talk to you soon. Talk to you later. Bye. Thanks, John.